Welcome to the latest edition of the Mind Gut Conversation podcast, a place to learn about the latest ideas from thought leaders in the area of health, food, the science of mind body interactions, and the environment. Today, I have the great pleasure to speak to Dr. Marvin Singh, founder of Precision Clinic and one of only a few integrative gastroenterologists in the United States. Dr. Singh did his internal medicine training at the University of Michigan, after which he completed a gastroenterology hepatology fellowship at Scripps Clinic Torrey Pines in La Jolla. He served as faculty member at Johns Hopkins University and UCLA before completing a fellowship in integrative medicine at the Andrew Weil Center for Integrative Medicine in Tucson, Arizona. Dr. Singh is not only a board certified gastroenterologist, but also diplomat and member of the board of the American Board of Integrative Medicine and the first director of integrative gastroenterology at the Susan Samueli Integrative Health Institute at the University of California in Irvine. He co-edited the second edition of the textbook of integrative gastroenterology and has contributed to many other articles and books. Dr. Singh is also the host of the podcast Precision, the HealthCast, and currently serves as the health advisor for Bottomless Closet in New York City, an organization that helps women in need. Welcome to the show, Dr. Singh. So I've been looking forward to this uh, conversation, uh, Marvin, for some time. I think the the last time that we have met face to face was when you were actually at UCLA. Um, yeah. <laughs> and um, I I greatly regret that you um, decided to move south from here and are now in San Diego and uh, in and in, in Irvine. So it would have been great to work with you together in in the same institution, but. I, I, I think, you know, considering that we're in such similar wavelength, I think that will happen anyway, despite the geographical distance. Especially these days. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you, especially can, you can work with anyone from anywhere these days. <laughs> so um, I want to start, um, so a question that I'm often asked in, in, in these podcasts is what, so there's hundreds, thousands of uh, physicians being trained uh, in this country and uh, coming out as an uh, card carrying integrative um, physician is something still very unusual. So what what happened in in your life early in your life or in the influences from people around you at, at that time that made you take that path? Yeah, that's a great question, you know, and and I didn't become a card carrying member until after I was already practicing. So I, I went through traditional training um, uh, like any other gastroenterologist would and um, very, you know, conservative trained. That's how, you know, most of us doctors are trained. Anyhow, uh, doctors are generally a conservative group as far as, you know, how to manage medical patients. And uh, then I went to probably one of the most ultra conservative places, uh, Johns Hopkins, as my first uh, job after training. And it's a fabulous institution. I mean, the, the best of the best and um, such great medicine is practiced there. But I kind of, as a new doctor, felt that... Um, something was missing, you know, people, people were bouncing from doctor to doctor, to doctor, maybe I saw that more so there because you know, Hopkins is like a quaternary referral center. So that's like, you know, the university send people to Hopkins for another opinion. So, you know, maybe it was, uh, maybe it was that, but um, I, I kind of felt that uh, something was missing from how we practice medicine and what we did for patients and that um, we, we were helping them when they were sick and when they were on the brink of death. But what about the majority of people who just had chronic symptoms or chronic issues and just kept going from place to place to place to try to find some resolution to that? How are we helping them? And I didn't feel that we were doing anything special as doctors in general. And I kind of felt lost. At one point, I felt maybe it's me. Maybe I just didn't learn enough in medical school. Maybe I Maybe I, uh, I, I, I should be reading something else. Maybe, maybe I, I should have studied more or something like that. And then I realized, you know, 
it's it's really not me. It's it's what what uh, it's just how we're trained. It's our upbringing as doctors, if you will. And uh, I guess I'm lucky to be uh, married to who I'm married to um, because my wife was very open-minded more so than me, even in, in health-related things. And she uh, bought me the book, Integrative Gastroenterology, and put it down on my desk and said, just take a look at this whenever you, whenever you want to. And, you know, no, no pressure or nothing. <laughs> and um, I started, I was a little hesitant at first. I started flipping through it and... Uh, I said that they're they're citing evidence here. You know, there's there's literature basis for some of these things they're talking about. These are things I've never heard about before, like, you know, using guided imagery in the ulcerative colitis patient. And, you know, this sounds really fascinating. And, um, you know, one thing led to another and I uh, became a fellow in the Andrew Weil Center for Integrative Medicine and decided I'm just going to learn more about it. Total blind leap of faith. And from there, uh, the story begins, I guess, for me, for integrative medicine, because I, I fell in love uh, as soon as we started the program and um, I really thought that this is what I needed uh, for myself and for my patients. And um, uh, here we are today. <laughs> so you really, you could say you followed your, your, your gut feelings, literally. I guess so. My microbes took me to Arizona. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, why do you think this happens? So one one experience that we have, you know, having a lot of um, pre med students um, come to us and ask for uh, if they could do some research. I mean, they, they ultimately want to get into the either into medical school or they want to get into become a gastroenterology fellow. So they come to us and do some some research project. And what I've noticed consistently that many of them, maybe the majority of them, that come to us actually have that kind of um, mindset or philosophy that 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 you just explained was missing in, in in your own training and then you know if you see them a few years later they they will take the traditional path you know they will not um, um, something the medical system does to them you know i don't want to call it brainwashing but uh, really change the, the more holistic view on on health and disease into something that fits into the conventional medical model. And um, so why do you think that's so rare that, that you know, young, um, and these, these are obviously, obviously all the brightest of the brightest that, you know, have this plan to, to go in this career, but why do so few of them actually stick with that? Yeah, that, you know, that thinking as you're saying that that's a very wise observation. I never really thought of it that way, but you're, you're right. I mean, many, Medical students and you know um, uh, early year house staff uh, may be very more open minded and wanting to do, you know, more integrative uh, type of things. And you know, I even see that at uh, Newport Beach in my my university practice, where you see a lot of eagerness of of younger uh, doctors, uh, you know, and doctors to be. And then where do they end up after after they're done? They end up in just regular jobs doing regular stuff and. I don't know if it's really brainwashing or it's more kind of like a it's more like boot camp we go through these days you know it's like it's like you know uh you go through this intense training and they just it's pounded into you that this equals this this equals this and everything's algorithm if this happens then then this then this then this then this and over and over and over again and then you know, uh, by the time you're done, that's, that's just how you think. It's just like, it's like boot camp. you know, you're, you're taught and trained in one way. And then you, you know, you may come in with your own ideas, like in the first day of boot camp. but, you know, uh, I guess that kind of gets pounded out of you, or maybe, you know, unfortunately, maybe you, you lose the, 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 the oomph you had behind being a, a doctor in the first place, because, uh, you know, a lot of us go in, to medicine thinking, you know, uh, we're going to heal people. We're going to help people. I like to help people. If you look at things that I wrote when I was a kid, like in college and high school, even, even in sixth grade, the, the, our, our sixth grade graduation was, what are your hopes and dreams? And I remember I wrote my hopes and dreams are to become a doctor because I want to help people. But um, I, I don't know. I think that uh, over, over time, by the time you uh, end up going through the whole process, you just kind of feel beaten up, um, and I think that's not a good thing. This is the this is our uh, institution of education uh, for physicians is is really not healthy for the physicians in the first place, and it's almost like you're beaten into submission, and you're just so tired by the end. You just 
do whatever you got to do to make some money now. Yeah. And, and that's why some doctors are the way they are. You know, um, it, it's, there's, there's so much burnout on many levels. Yeah. And this is, so, so you've, you've addressed the topic, this burnout and the rising rate of depression and even, even suicide, which is, you know, hard to imagine that uh, like you come at the end of your, uh, end of your dreams, uh, having invested, you know, so much time and energy, and then um, that doesn't seem to be meaning in it. So I, I, I think that's something it's it's one of these unanticipated consequences of of our med, uh, medical training and the the intense competition to get there um but also the side effect is that many patients do not get what they expect from from a healthcare system you know they obviously the system is is still great and and un, unsurpassed in terms of a disease care system you know mm -hmm. that we keep people alive but I, I always laugh about this, this, this title healthcare system. And like, you know, even at our institution, everything is health, but in reality, everything is disease. Um, and everything is coming up with new ways of diagnosing disease and, and treating, you know, some of these heroic accomplishments, uh, war against cancer. That's not really, you know, the healthcare it's, it's, it's fighting, um, it's it's fighting biology, not 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 really enhancing the the intrinsic ability of, of the body to to heal itself. Health healthcare system with the McDonald's in the cafeteria. <laughs> <laughs> in my medical school, I remember, um, you know, uh, we, we would go there and grab some hash browns and a coffee, uh, you know, and take your take your McDonald's hash brown and and then eat uh, eat that while you're watching the rest of the lectures and. That's no healthcare system right there. That's a sick care system. <laughs> exactly. So let me just interrupt for a second because this question at the end, but I, I think this is a good point to really um, post this, this, this um, following this, this discussion that we've had. Um, what, what, do you think, what do you think that in 20 years from now, given all the various factors, economically, politically, um, but also what we just talked about this, the, the the side effects that the medical training has and the uh, changing preferences of patients. What do you? I mean, what do you think the healthcare system would look like in twenty years from now? I can tell you what I hope it would look like. Um, I, I I don't know whether we'll get there a um, hundred percent in twenty years. As um, I, I, I heard a story that when the stethoscope was invented, it took over 50 years for the medical institution to accept it as a tool a doctor could use because it was unheard of to have to use something like that. <laughs> so uh, as we know, uh, you know, health healthcare institution is very, um, is chronically diseased and it, it takes time to sometimes reverse disease. <laughs> Um, you know, I think, uh, but especially I think uh, uh, if we try to look for something uh, important or positive that could come out of something negative. Um, this COVID-19 pandemic should have at least brought about the idea to people that, you know, uh, one of the most important things to protect yourself uh, and improve your immune system is looking at your, your lifestyle and um, uh, uh, correcting your internal factors, your metabolism, your blood sugar balance, and, and your diet, and all those kind of things. And I think um, a lot of people became more tuned in to this kind of concept. And what I would hope, and, and you know, it very well may be because the, the rapidity at which technology is, is advancing now that we have the technology that we've spent decades trying to develop. Um, and uh, I, I hope that uh, one day, you know, it will be you know, common that everybody has their genome sequenced and, you know, other very personalized data available readily and that we have some sort of uh, electronic medical record system that can keep track of some of these things and can help the doctors make guided decisions for patients where, you know, you may type in a constellation of symptoms or problems and diagnoses and uh, the artificial intelligence behind it helps guide the doctor using the personalized information to make the right decisions uh, for the patient. That would be, you know, medicine 2.0. And uh, really using that information to help prevent 
um, the, uh, the patient from actually getting a problem or getting sick from something. That's one of the main things that I, I would hope that in 20 years, the medical system would be more geared towards is really prevention because right now this, uh, the, our system is, is really geared around what we call sick care, not, not well care. If you have a problem, you go to the doctor, they'll cover you. But if you go to the doctor just for fun to see what can I do to be healthier, what do you think you're going to get out of that visit? Probably not, not much, really. They'll check your cholesterol and your CBC and metabolic panel and send you on your way, probably. And if you're lucky, they'll check a vitamin D also, you know, so, you know, that's uh, but but that's just on the very superficial level of of what well care is. So hopefully in the future, we'll be more tuned into that and we'll be practicing more well care because it's so much more powerful to understand what what protoplasm you have, what are the risk factors you have, and then how can we address those? Because if we address risk factors before they become a problem, then um, we may be able to prevent that problem. Or if that problem is in our destiny to happen, maybe we can pre prevent the onset of it, or maybe it won't be so bad as it could be if we address certain risk factors beforehand. So, you know, that's really what's going to help people live longer and be healthier and enjoy their quality of life during the time they are alive uh, better. And I hope that's where we go. And we have a lot of the pieces of technology, I think. I think we just need to continue working on that and, and getting people more tuned into this type of approach. Because right now, you know, I mean, if, if you wanted to, if you said, hey, I want to go get a diet, uh, go get a consultation from a dietitian, there's nothing wrong with that. A lot of people should, everybody should have a consultation with a dietitian, I think. But insurance is not going to pay for it unless like you're diabetic or you have kidney disease. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's not fair, you know, because, you know, and I even think uh, Dean Ornish's program uh, that, that was uh, accepted to be covered by Medicare is, is only accepted after you've had your first heart attack or your mm -hmm. cardiac event. Mm -hmm. What's the point of that? I mean, uh, yeah, if, if I had my first heart attack, I sure, sure do want to know that kind of stuff. But why would I want to wait till I have my heart attack before I figure out what I can do to prevent it? It doesn't make any sense. Well, this is an important point. I mean, obviously, there's there's multiple obstacles, you know, that are in the way of, of, of really uh, reforming or I, I think it's more revolution really of, of, of the medical system, um, one of which is reimbursement. You know, yeah. you, you, you certainly physicians and hospitals particularly make more money in a in a sick care system than in a healthcare system in general, um, and reimbursement, as you just said in this example from Dean Ornish, you know if you have to get sick first before this is sort of um, um, available or or, or um, uh, you know paid for by uh, by insurance companies, then it sort of misses the main purpose of of, of prevention. I would say, you know, I mean, another another obstacle has 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 been that, you know, the I mean, the medical system is sort of like a. I always like to compare it to an to an aircraft carrier. I mean, to turn it around is takes an enormous effort. Even even if the captain of that ship wants to turn it around, you know, it's 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 not an easy not an easy task. But at the same time, I, I think we see a lot of, you know, we see a lot of changes sort of that are not sort of affecting the the. The traditional healthcare system, where we we've seen, uh, you know, the rise of functional medicine, um, where it's finally now gradually seeing the rise of integrative medicine. Um, so for 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 a patient who wants to get right now the optimal uh, healthcare uh, and healthcare system, what would you recommend? I mean, not 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 everybody can see somebody like yourself or or the handful of integrative gastroenterologists, but what would you recommend for, for patients? That's a good question. Um, you know, uh, and outside of um, seeing somebody uh, who they think they can identify with that can guide them properly, you know, uh, I would caution on the resources that people use online. This is where we're going to find it also in the next 20 years, uh, as we were talking, probably a big crackdown. Um, they're, they're, everybody's a doctor now. That's the problem. You see, the, it's like we have a problem that's inherent that we that that administrative type people could fix and how insurance is run in this country, how healthcare is delivered in this country, but they didn't. 
or, or they haven't, or they haven't done it right um, for various reasons, politics, money, you know, the, this is all often what drives decision-making in business, not, not actual outcome of how to help people, but how to make money. That's the unfortunate thing of this country um, and how we operate in certain things. Um, but uh, that system didn't change, but what changed? The people said, well, you're not going to give it to me. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to give it to ourselves. Mm -hmm. And healthcare practitioners started coming along those lines or people that actually wanted to help people came across those lines and started talking about health. I mean, we have uh, all kinds of people, not medical doctors talking about health and wellness now. So that created this whole conversation about health and wellness and functional medicine and integrated medicine, which were always there, came to the forefront because this is where the doctors that are <laughs> more um, minded towards these types of topics are sitting in, in, in that type of training. Um, and then, uh, you know, but alongside that great progress, also you have to be cautioned uh, about because there are people who think they know what they're talking about are talking and there are people who mean well but don't know well enough that um, uh, are also speaking so I would guide people to make sure that you look at who you're listening to look at um, the, their background and training and whether they, they, they should be speaking on certain topics or not. I mean, you wouldn't come to me as a gastroenterologist if you had, you know, a tumor in your brain you needed operation on. You wouldn't do that. You wouldn't go to the guy at the gas station and ask him to make you a gourmet meal. He's not a chef. At least you wouldn't think he would be a chef. <laughs> I mean, you know, you, you wouldn't do that. So, you know, why would you go to somebody uh, who uh, isn't a healthcare practitioner whatsoever, never had any training or education in healthcare and take medical advice from them and even take medicines from them? You know, um, so uh, I would just advise people to think about that because this whole concept of wellness also became an industry in and of itself. And um, there are a lot of people like myself who mean well to try to help people be well or using that word in, in that in that proper context. And then there are other people who are using that word to try to make money. So just like like our healthcare system is sick, we have to make sure that we follow the right directions um, uh, and make sure that the people behind it that we're listening to are actually really meaning to do well for us. Yeah, I personally think this this is a huge problem, particularly, you know, having having been involved in pretty deeply involved in my career in, in biomedical research um, that, you know, so, so many recommendations now are based on um, not on evidence, but based on uh, I don't even know where some of these ideas and concepts come from, but once <laughs> once they get out into the public, either through a best-selling book or through uh, you know podcasts, um, they they sort of take their own momentum. You know, they 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 grow, and all of a sudden, there are established uh, guidelines for 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 some things. That's true about I think all the dietary guidelines. Um, less so for the I would say for the mind-targeted therapies. Where we have less of that, uh, you know, confusion. Um, but in terms of diet and supplements um, and 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 testing, I, I think there's a huge danger. And you know, fortunately, you have you have taken the lead in um, you know writing an authoritative book on uh, what things are actually justified or supported by evidence. But for for the majority of these things, uh, th that's not the case. The spokes the spokespeople, spokesperson um, is not a, not always a trustworthy physician, but it's, um, I mean, always come back to this, you know, maybe a best-selling author. So the, mm -hmm. so the more outrageous the message is, the, the more books you sell and, uh, you know, the, the more popular that, that, that gets. So somehow the scientific peer review has been replaced by, um, you know, the number Social of review. <laughs> yeah, social review, the number of followers, <laughs> you know, how, how big your mailing list is, and you know how many books you sell. So th that's hopefully is a trend that we'll see gradually disappear by, uh, you know, people trained like yourself who, who sort of reintroduce um, 
you know evidence and 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 science back into the field. So I I, I mean I hope that this will be something in the next twenty years that we'll be seeing uh, weeding out a lot of the you know a, a lot of those unsubstantiated messages that are floating around right now i think the medical boards uh, at in each state will probably end up getting involved in, in some way you know uh, because what really is happening is that people are practicing without a license in the most simple form of it man to apply for a medical license in the state of california you know it is not a simple process where you walk in and get your photo taken and you get your card on the way out <laughs> it is a months long process with fbi background checks and looking into every training place you went to making sure you actually graduated making sure that every, all the you know uh, everything is in order before they actually grant you permission to be a doctor in the state even if you are you know the world world's expert in everything that exists in medicine, you still have to go through that process. So if a medical doctor who's actually gone through medicine and all this training has to go through that, then why should a, you know, uh, I don't know, there are some weird names of uh, some things too, but, you know, like, uh, people that will say that they're a dietitian, but not even actually trained as a dietitian, as an example, you know, they'll say that they're a dietitian, but they're not really even, they just could be just a random regular person mm -hmm. that just interested in health. Why should they be able to practice medicine and give people supplements for thyroid disease or, or autoimmune disease or, or Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis? You know, what are they basing their evidence on? They may not even know what PubMed is, and they just may be basing their evidence based on Google searches and coming up with ideas and their own protocols that way. And they may mean well, and they may not be purposely malicious trying to harm somebody, but, and it may be that they have helped themselves uh, in, in doing this, uh, you know, uh, this kind of approach where their doctors had failed them in the past. Um, but at the same time, it's one thing to do your own research and help yourself. But then when you're trying to deal with um, uh, somebody who's actually sick, somebody who's vulnerable, somebody who actually needs help because they're bleeding from, uh, you know, ulcerative colitis, for example, it's wrong to tell them to go get colonics and do like, you know, months long of anti-parasitic cleanses for mm -hmm. zero reason whatsoever when the problem is very obvious. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, unfortunately, I've seen people with colon cancers and, and severe colitis and, and uh, other kinds of conditions come to me after they've been through this gamut uh, and realized I should go see a doctor now. And sometimes it's, it's, it's too late. And that, that's that's the reason why I'm speaking on it. Not not that you know uh, I'm trying to say bad things about um, uh, everybody in the health and wellness. I, I certainly am not. And there are a lot of people who are not physicians in the space who are very smart people, smarter than a lot of physicians actually, and know more and are able to educate people on health, nutrition, and all things wellness um, much more than their than their primary care doctor. So, but the point is to really look at who that who the person is that you're listening to what kind of training they have and what reputation they have and you know just do your own research um uh, on that that's that that was that's kind of the takeaway you know because there are people because there are not enough physicians there are not enough medical doctors to be able to help people in this regards mm -hmm. um uh, and people need it and they want it so just do your research and who you're going to listen to you know they even teach us in the in the uh, actually, this is a funny story. This, this is a, at the at the fellowship Andrew Weil Center for Integrated Medicine. Um, we were learning about hypnosis in the in the hypnosis module. Um, they they were telling us that you know getting a license uh, as a hypnotist is, uh, or at least was at one point so flaky they were like made up organizations that would give you licenses and stuff or or pretend licenses and i think as an experiment they um they somebody had a cat and they they registered the cat as a licensed hypnotherapist and the cat got a license based on that information so so you know you got to be careful you know just because somebody says something it doesn't mean that they actually are something so do your research if you're if you're not sure that somebody is uh you know, uh, a licensed whatever. Most of these places to get the license, they have a website where you can actually verify the license if you're not sure about it. There are ways to that you can do research without spending too much time, but you just have to make sure that you do that research. 
Yeah, I think that's a really important point. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, we could go on with this general discussion for some time because there's so many interesting <laughs> points to it. But I want to come back to to the book that you have written and that will be published soon. Do you, do you have any idea when it will come out? Yeah, we're looking at uh, mid-September, so not, not too far away from now. Okay, so um, it's called Rescue Your Health. And... Um, I want, you know, just want to go briefly through some of these points that you um, that that you deal with in this book. It's certainly, I would say, one of the most authoritative guides on on a variety of things, from from the testing to the, uh, you know, to what kind of interventions you should do. Um, it's it's really based. I mean, what do you think? What would you say the the three principles that this book is 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 based on? <laughs> 